SJC 12324, Commonwealth v. Thomas A. Woods. Mr. Jacobson, good morning. Good morning, Chief Justice. May it please the court, my name is Miles Jacobson. I represent Mr. Woods in this appeal from the denial of a motion for new trial. The motion for new trial judge was Judge McGuire, not the original trial judge. Judge McGuire. Be before you get started, help me to know the motion for new trial was denied, then you appealed, I gather. Correct. To the gatekeeper? Correct. And which, which, which of us was the gatekeeper for that, do you know? I, I don't recall. Okay. But I do recall that he allowed me to put, come, it was a male person, and oh, okay. he allowed and me to come forward. Okay, down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it was All right, a male person. Down. Okay, go ahead, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> so he decided that this was a new and substantial issue, and here we are. So Judge McGuire um, made an error of law, which is why we're here. He decided that we were, that Mr. Woods was in fact a target at the time he appeared before the grand jury on the murder case before his trial. Now, in the direct appeal in this case, the SJC decided not to disturb, they found no reason, and they said they found no reason to disturb the trial court's finding that Mr. Woods was not a target at that time based on representations made and whatever was and wasn't said at the time. But even if, didn't, the, didn't we also say that even if uh, Mr. Woods was a target, the Commonwealth was under no obligation to, to notify him of that fact? Yes, Justice Budd, you did. And I'm not complaining that you did not notify him that he was a target. Not what I've ever said once although the Commonwealth has made that, in my view, misrepresentation of Mr. Woods's position numerous times, and which is why I wrote a reply brief focused on that very issue. That's, that's what I don't get, though. Um, our decision held that even if he were a target, right, it wouldn't matter. No, Judge, if you, with respect. That's, that's the question I have. That, and that is the first important question. So let me address that. And that is what Judge McGuire said. Judge McGuire said, okay, I find he's a target, but guess what, you don't get any relief because in the 2014 Woods decision, we decided that issue. You're not entitled to, not only not a target, Justice Budd, but you're not entitled to be advised of your rights against self-incrimination. That's what Justice McGuire said this court decided, that it was constitutionally not required, and that is not what this court said. This court said, in fact, that the issue had not been decided federally, it had not been decided in the state. Well, this is again, whether when you're a target. Let me read you the exact sentence from Justice Cordy's decision. Even if the defendant were a target, the Commonwealth was under no obligation to warn him of that status. Correct, your, your honor. Okay. The, the distinction between warning him that he's a target mm -hmm. and warning him who, because he is a target, or if I use a different word, advising him that he has a right against incriminating himself. But isn't that that the, distinction isn't that is entirely the, different? But isn't that the target warning? No. That you're a target and therefore it's not? No. Because it isn't is. that what Justice Cordy said the warning was? No. Okay. The tar in fact, what, <laughs> what Justice Cordy said was this. They were deciding, you decided, this court decided, that there would be a new rule, prospectively, that you would have to let notify. Just, let, and I, I don't mean to keep interrupting you, and I no, promise I'll not. stop. Um, I just want to read Justice Cordy's words again. Yes. The United States Department of Justice requires that grand jury targets and subjects defined as person whose conduct is within the scope of the grand jury investigation, here's the key part, be advised of their right to avoid self-incrimination as a matter of policy. Right, now I put, uh, the reason why the, that came to this court's attention is I spent a long time in my original brief on what the federal prosecution, federal prosecutors do. 
There are two different warnings, and the case law makes it very clear there are two different warnings. They could be both of them, in which case you can put them together and call it one warning. But one is a warning that you are a target. One is an advisement or a warning that under these circumstances, you have the right not to answer questions that may tend to incriminate you. That's the key distinction. And if, when you read, again, Judge Cody's opinion, what he says is this. In fact, why do we have even a future rule? It's because, Judge Cody points out, or this court says, because <laughs> grand jury testimony is compelled, that is, Woods for the first time found that a grand jury summons, which says you are ordered to come to this place and give testimony, that that summons is a form of compulsion. And Judge Cody says, and I quote at page 719 of the decision, 466 Mass., because the grand jury testimony is compelled, it ought to be ameliorated with, ad aduce, with advisement of rights, advisement of rights against self-incrimination. Now, I have to say this. There, there's nowhere where this court decided that it wasn't a constitutional problem. They don't decide, and it wouldn't have been appropriate to decide the constitutional problem, because according to this court, using what Judge Troy had found below, he wasn't the target. So it would just be dicta at this point. There wouldn't be a way to hold that you had, you wouldn't want to reach a constitutional issue Can I get based to on that? that set of facts. Excuse so, me. Mr. Jacobson, um, last, uh, last night I was trying to figure out as well who the single justice was, but it was sounding familiar to me, and it ends up that it was me. And uh, I was saying to myself, well, why, why, why did I allow this? And then as I was reading um, the motion uh, the, uh, to supplement the record, the AD motion, uh, I remembered. And the issue was, did Judge Troy have before him all of the grand jury attachments to the prior bad acts motion in limine? And if, because two of the witnesses in the grand jury um, had testified in a way that suggested that the defendant was a target. Now, we have the motion for clarification that we received uh, a couple of days ago, um, and, and so doesn't that address the issue of whether Judge Troy had before him the grand jury minutes of the witnesses who at least by, with layers of hearsay, had implicated your client? Partly, but I want to address that. I will, if I will, if I may, I want to address this right now. Please. As I understand it, what was going on in the trial court before Judge Troy were two different motions. They were being discussed differently, and sometimes on the same day, but then they were decided differently. One was the defense counsel's motion to exclude evidence, including the grand jury evidence. And it's in that motion that Judge Troy said, well, I need to know whether he's a target, because if he's a target, it's going to make a big difference to my ruler. And he says, turns to the prosecutor and says, so, was he a target? When did he become a target? And the prosecutor then says he became a target. He wasn't a target. He became a target afterwards. The prosecutor says this. He became a target afterwards, after, that is to say, afterwards testified. And when did he become a target? He became a target when we got information about these threats. And he did never mention the fact of the DeRosha testimony, which is the one which was, so uh, as Judge McGuire found, and as you just indicated, there were two grand jury witnesses who testified before Woods. Right. One was David Sheff, and the, both of whom talk about these threats. One was David Sheff, and the other was Nicole DeRosha. Now, David Sheff's testimony was not given to the judge under any circumstances, for any purpose. That's not one of the motions. That's not one of the transcripts that was given. That's not what the government is saying now. What they're saying is they gave the DeRoche transcript. Now, let's talk about why they gave the DeRoche transcript, because it actually makes their case worse, in my opinion, that it happened, not better. Here's why. The government gave them the DeRoche motion, not in the context of objecting 
to whether or not he was a target or trying to establish when he was a target, but to try to prove bad acts. What bad acts? The very bad acts of making these threats. In fact, they produce a memorandum. I mean, they file a memorandum in support of their motion for the bad acts, and they list a number of grand jury witnesses who testified afterwards. And then they list DeRocha, who testified beforewards. They don't give any dates as to when any of these things happened. So unless you go look at the actual dates of the transcript, unless you're going to assume that Judge Troy actually inspected the transcripts and knew when well, these... But, but, but we, we don't have to assume that because we've got a transcript from the motions in limine where Judge Troy um, carefully uh, uh, states on the record what he reviewed. But he doesn't say that he, reviewed, that he paid any attention, and a person may not, to the dates on which those different matters were given. And he may well, and it appears that he did, rely upon the prosecutor's representations. Now, the prosecutor misrepresented the facts. The prosecutor did not say, and look at the DeRoche, did not mention the DeRoche testimony when he, was when he was saying when he became a target. He said, the prosecutor said, he became a target afterwards when we got threats. So Judge Troy was relying, you get a pile of documents, they say various things. There's something on page one that might, or 25, or the and signature page that might be significant. You're the judge. You may have read everything and memorized it, and you may know exactly what you think is material or not, or you may, to some extent, rely upon representations of counsel. What's going on here, counsel? You tell me. When did he become a target? The prosecutor should have said at that point, well, there were threats afterwards, but there was also this threat before. Now, that's not in the transcript. That's not even impliedly in the transcript. Well, two things. One is Judge, Judge Troy talks about re, um, having the grand jury minutes, and he, he was a very uh, careful, assiduous uh, uh, judge. And the second thing is that, as I understand it, David Sheff and Nicole DeRocha, they, um, they didn't testify to hearing threats. They testified to hearing people tell them that they had heard threats. Well, we're talking, yes, Judge, that's true. Although we're talking about probable cause to, for, to indict. You don't, you, probable cause is sufficient for indictment, never mind for target status. You have two different individuals. Chef, who no one is saying that he had the chef transcript, by the way. No one says that Judge Troy, Judge Troy doesn't say it, the government doesn't say it, certainly the defense doesn't say it, that he had the chef transcript. Ms. Uh, I'm reading exactly the exchange between Mr. Flanagan and the judge. And I don't, it's not quite as clear as you say. He doesn't, he doesn't say they only testify. He says that there's, let me read you the exact language. I'm going to suggest to you again, I, I add only that because I suggested it buttresses the com, Commonwealth position that he was somewhat of interest. Okay, here's the key sentence. And the more that the investigation went on and in subsequent months when witnesses came in and testified about threatening statements under oath, testified to threatening statements that Mr. Woods has made to Mr. Mullen, he, he, he doesn't talk about what the people before him said. Correct. That's the problem. But I understand, but the, the, your sister's going to argue, well, that's hearsay testimony anyway, and it's well, not going to be admissible. Um, he so, was asked, you, you, excuse me, Judge. No, go ahead. I'm just reading the sentences. Again. I understand that. But let's keep in mind this. Hmm. It's always the prosecutor, in retrospect. The, pro <laughs> the prosecutor is asking that DeRoche's testimony be introduced. Not here he's not answering. Of course not there. He's not talking about it there. But in his own motion in limine before Judge Troy to admit bad acts, mm -hmm. if you read that memorandum, he's asking that DeRoche's testimony. It's a separate discussion with the judge, right? That's a, that's a trial. That's post this discussion, right? Or is that in this particular motion in limine? It's in the motion. In, no, there are two motions in limine, one by the defense, one by the prosecutor. Right. In so, the one by the prosecutor, filed before the hearing mm -hmm. on the motion that we're talking about now, that is the defense motion to exclude, before, filed before that hearing, mm -hmm. the prosecutor tries to admit, says, I want to, here are some transcripts. Why am I giving you these transcripts? It's because I want to call these witnesses and have them testify. 
Now, the, the, the chef testimony was what you might call classic hearsay. Although classic hearsay under certain circumstances certainly can be adequate for target status and certainly can be, artic- it can be adequate for indicting somebody, probable cause. But with DeRoche's testimony, there's a good chance that DeRoche's testimony would have been considered a, a kind of outburst because what she's re- that could be admitted if there's an exception to hearsay for a statement that just gets made, but uh, an excited st- utterance statement, because it's a, her boyfriend is saying, you're going to shoot me? That's what's going to happen? You're going to shoot me? She's R- talking but, but, her, but, she, but her statement's more, it's, it's mixed, because she thinks he's laughing, too, right? He's no, not, he, I, this is a different conversation. He's not laughing, then. Uh, he's, when she, the key t- testimony you're relying on here concludes by her saying, he wasn't, he, she, he was laughing about it, right? The Roche's testimony ends by saying that the victim was laughing about the threats, right? You could laugh, for, I mean, there are all sorts of ways you can laugh and under different circumstances. They ask her, was it taken seriously? There's lots of indication that it was taken seriously if you read the entire DeRoche transcript. But let's consider this. Judge McGuire, on a motion for new trial, found he was a target. And he's considering not just these grand jury transcripts, but he's considering the circumstances of the case. Well, it's, it's Here, a three-page decision um, that doesn't explain why, just sort of concludes he's a target, and then says it doesn't matter. So it's not, it's not a detailed exploration of this, which we have to do now. I understand. And I'm not suggesting that you're bound by Judge And, and we have two inconsistent decisions. We have Judge Troy who's got everything but chef, it sounds like, concluding he's not a target. And then we have McGuire, who has everything including chef, and finds he is a target, but says it doesn't matter. Well, I think that's true. And and your case is going to rise or fall on prosecutorial misconduct or ineffective assistance, right? Um, And your, your predecessor, trial counsel, had all of this stuff. He, fo- he filed an affidavit, too. He said, he, said he it w- would have been relevant to put in. He didn't have a strategic reason for not putting it in. But Judge Troy says, and you're not taking this into account. But does, that, does that suggest that when you say the prosecutor is behaving improperly, that, you know, in the, that they're both sort of, there's a lot of information rushing at them at the same time. I'm just, before we find a prosecutor is, you know, engaged in misconduct, when he's doing the same thing that the defense counsel is doing. I uh, really respect, I don't think so. I think make, being silent, which is what defense counsel did, is different than saying something. But I want to point this one, one thing out. Hmm? Judge Troy says, it would make a difference to me if he were a target. Now, he's not, there's no discussion about, well, these people don't make him a target, even though there's this testimony. And I think... Does to, that, Judge Troy doesn't have the benefit of... of our decision, which says it doesn't matter at the time whether you're a target or not. It doesn't matter what your decision was for Judge Troy, and here's why. What was before Judge Troy was not the constitutional issue. Mm-hmm. What was before, not that constitutional issue. What was before Judge Troy was, was this a free and willing statement? Right. And he says, Judge Troy, in his wisdom, is saying, look, I want to take this fact into account. It's going to matter. A whole lot. And by the way, there isn't one case in the country where a person was a target, was not advised of their rights against self-incrimination, their grand jury minutes were used against them at trial over objection, right. and that doesn't exist. That case doesn't exist. This would be the first case. Judge McGuire's determination that he was a target, that was, um, that was uh, based on the grand jury minutes, is that right? Well, it's based partly on grand jury minutes, so it's also based on the context of the crime. You have an individual, you have a person who's assassinated or killed, murdered, who, and if he is indeed the target, Paul Mullen, the victim in this case, somebody set him up. Two men come around a gas station, all of a sudden shoot this guy, and then disappear into thin air. No one ever knows who the shooters are. How did those, if, assuming that Paul Mullen was the target, how did these guys know? Yeah, but the and the most likely reason they know was Woods. 
No, I, I, I understand, so that's and I understand we still don't know who the, 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 the shooter is. But the reason for my question is is, is the standard of review. Um, if, if, if Judge McGuire made his determination based on the same uh, documentation that we're going to be looking at, um, Judge McGuire's determination that he was a target uh, wasn't a credibility determination. It was a record review determination. I agree. Mr. Jacobson, your, your time is up, but let, let me just make sure I understand, because this is an unusual case. Uh, my understanding is, with regard to the target warning, in view of our decision in Woods 1, with the next one to be Woods 2, uh, you're saying that in you're saying that with regard to that issue, we would need to determine that he was a target and that that was a constitutional violation and that you should get the benefit of our first time determination that that was a constitutional violation and therefore should order its suppression. Is that correct? Largely, but there's also, even if it's not a constitutional violation, the cases uh, for uh, the adjunct, uh, adjutant case, if I have the name right. Yeah, adjutant, I understand that. But haven't we already decided that if it's purely a superintendent's issue, you're not going to prevail? You would have had the right in that issue, since the issue was raised below. Right, it wasn't just if the but issue means, just... But, if, but hasn't that ship sailed with regard to the superintendent's issue? No. You would have had the right to include yeah, I, him. I, I don't want to necessarily argue it, but I mean, so you're, you're claiming that that ship has not sailed. Yes, I'm claiming that the reason, what, what I'm saying is this, had you known he was a target at that time, that it would be an injustice to say, yes, if I knew he was a target then, and by the way, I think he's a target now, but he doesn't get the relief because we thought he wasn't a target, because defense counsel never brought up these issues. Okay, so you're, you're, you're saying that if now that we that we should first determine that he was a target, where we had before said that Judge Troy was not in error in finding he was not, and that we should say we should apply our ruling either constitutionally or pursuant to our superintendent's power to this case. That's, yes. Okay. As to the ineffective, as to the other claim, I gather that your argument is that the ADA in this case engaged in conduct so egregious with regard to his uh, failure to tell Judge Troy about the testimony or about the timing, it's really more about the timing of the grand jury testimony because the issue was, it, all that, what matters is not so much the content of the testimony, but, but that that testimony was heard before they called Woods to the grand jury. Yes, yeah, since Judge Troy asked that question. Right, so your, your argument is that the conduct of the AG, ADA was sufficiently egregious that we should dismiss the case because of egregious misconduct? Or? Well, I, I think there are two choices if you find prosecutorial misconduct. One is that you dismiss if you think that it's serious enough. But the other is that you don't dismiss, but that you give him a new trial. Because there's an unfairness if to some extent the verdict is the result of government misconduct. And, and, and the new trial would, I mean, but are you saying just give him a new trial, or are you saying that that would require us to suppress his grand jury testimony, or suppress his, the admission at, at, the, at, at trial of the I don't grand think, jury testimony? I'm sorry, Judge, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to sort out precisely what I, you're asking. I, I appreciate that. I don't think you would have to, I think you could give him a new trial without ruling that this could not be used against him. Okay, so you would say that because of the misconduct, it warrants either dismissal of the case or at here, here, least here. A, a new trial as, as sort of a sanction for the misconduct. Here's why. Judge Troy wasn't trying to decide the constitutional question. He wasn't trying to decide whether or not you have the constitutional right to, to get a self-incrimination warning under these circumstances. He was trying to decide the issue of whether this was a free and voluntary statement and he thought, I'm going to look at various kinds of compulsion in the circumstance. I, 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 understand. I understand. I have one. And that's why it doesn't have to be decided. One to question go back. before everything ends, and that is if we ruled in your favor, what would the impact be for other gatekeeper cases in which there have been a motion for new trial and perhaps a finding that's inconsistent with something a, a trial judge or a motion judge found? I'm not understanding your question. It judge, would be, separate. well, it would be, let's say another case comes along in which we have, to, we have had a finding by a judge 
and a ruling by us that affirms everything. And then, so the first appeal is over, and now the defendant goes, files a motion for a new trial, gets a finding from a motion for a new trial judge that's inconsistent with the first finding, and then through the gatekeeper come for a while, great gatekeeper petition, and then we would be for, in a similar position, wouldn't we? I don't with so. other cases? If I'm, if, I'm, if I'm understanding your question appropriately, Justice Cipher, the difference would be this. The first judge found that he was a target, in my view, based on the representations of the prosecutor and the failure of defense counsel to say, well, what about these transcripts that occurred previously? And the, the trial judge made it clear he wanted to know the point I understand of the facts okay. of your case. But then, but then... I'm not talking about your case, though. I'm talking about similar ones after this. But it's not unusual to find... It's not unusual for a motion for a new trial judge based on different understandings of the facts. So I'm asking, are we asking... Uh, are we setting up a different kind of uh, appellate review? Not at all. Okay. I'm, I'm content if that's your answer. All right. Thank you. Ms. Burpine? Thank you. May I please the court? Carolyn Burbine for the Commonwealth. It's the Commonwealth's position um, regarding uh, the first issue is that um, in the direct appeal in this case, the court did say that even if the defendant was a target of the grand jury, the Commonwealth was not required to warn him of that status. That's on page 717 of the Woods decision. Um, so at the time that the defendant testified at the grand jury in 2006, February 10th, um, the law was that even if the Commonwealth deemed him a target, he was not entitled to the target warning and the prosecutor wasn't required to give the warning. And this is direct estoppel against the defendant's claim uh, as raised in the motion for trial and Judge McGuire's ruling denying the motion to the, the trial was correct. The defend, your brother argues that there's a difference between warning and the substance of the warning. Um, I, I'm not sure I... Un I, I don't I, I agree with that. I, I, I read uh, Justice Cordy's decision to say um, that the warning that we're talking about when we're talking about a target warning is a warning against self-incrimination. Um, so um, I would posit that um, Judge McGuire's uh, ultimate ruling denying the motion for a trial was correct and uh, where the defendant's claim must fail even if he were a target, this court must affirm the conviction. And of I course we don't... Got a Back, back up argument, something to the effect of um, if, because this court thought he wasn't a target, we didn't apply it retroactively in the exercise of our superintendent's powers, um, and it would be unfair to do so here, given that we were wrong on the facts of whether he's a target. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, I would never agree that he um, that you were wrong uh, as to whether he was a target. Uh, but the the consideration then, and and st it's still not a constitutional uh, requirement. It's a it's a superintendent's power issue. And but we can't apply. And again, I'm the least knowledgeable on backwards applying the superintendent's. We can't apply our superintendent's powers retroactively. I don't know if that's ever been done before, Your Honor. I did not. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think what we did in, in adjutant. Right. Uh, yeah. We did apply it in that case. I've just been trying to think whether that was a superintendent's power. I think it was done pursuant to sort of an interest of justice view with regard to that case. And then there was the companion case involving King the Wilson. shooting in Cambridge. Uh, King Wilson. Yeah. Uh, Pring Wilson, I think, right. where we did it. So I think. I guess the concern, I mean, I mean, I understand the fact of the matter is that when we did Woods 1, I'm probably the only one in this court who was here for Woods 1, except for Justice Link, uh, we did not have any information with regard to what had been presented to the grand jury beforehand by Mr. Schiff or Mr. DeRocher. So if we don't know that, of course, we're going to find that Judge Troy was not clearly erroneous in determining he was not a target because the argument as to why that was clearly erroneous wasn't information we had. So we say that was not clearly erroneous and we say we're going to impose this new rule and we don't need to worry. We don't need to think very hard 
about whether we should apply it here in the interest of justice because it wasn't before us. Uh, but I guess what your brother is arguing is that we would now, if we were to find, based on this new information, that Judge McGuire was right, that we would at least have to think about whether or not this would be an appropriate case to apply it uh, as we did an adjutant to this case. I, I, I think that's probably what the argument would be. Well, my response to that, Your Honor, is that I think it's important to note that in Judge McGuire's decision, he is relying on the newly promulgated definition of target, uh, which includes uh, now a person who uh, the, the prosecutor believes may um, well, it's, may an old, it, it's, a it's an old definition. It's the U.S. Attorney's Manual. Was but it there wasn't. Long ago. You know, we, we, the court we, was clear in stating in 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 Woods that this is a new, a new uh, rule. A new rule. Right. So I, I think it's very important to note that distinction. That when Magu Judge McGuire said, um, "I find he's a target," that's that he's relying on that brand new definition, and that was not the definition at the time that Judge Troy had this case, and at the time that he reviewed um, the grand jury minutes and. And I'd like to turn to the, the, the claim of prosecutorial misconduct. It's a serious allegation, and it's not borne out by the record. Um, it was actually, as, as the Commonwealth has indicated, it was the prosecutor who gave Judge Troy all of these uh, grand jury minutes that we're discussing here. And he, he your included- Your brother says he didn't give Chef. Is that- I right. don't believe he did. Uh, not with the prior bad acts one that I, that I discussed. Um, Wait, he did give- again? I, I was, uh, I found the prior bad acts one. I would have to look back and see if in any other context he gave Chef. I was focused on um, Clancy. Uh, the judge, the when Judge Troy says, I've read the grand jury stuff, what is before him? Um, he at least had DeRosha, Clancy, Flaherty, Hobbs, Deutsch, and the defendant. Um, he may have had more in conjunction with other motions in Lemonet. Those, these were the ones that I uh, focused on in my brief, mm -hmm. but, but and in, those are the ones that I've, I've, I've determined that he had. But, but, but help me again, in fairness, um, to, it, in fairness to Judge Troy, my understanding is, uh, and you know the case much better than I do, that there's a motion in Lemonet hearing. There are at least two motions before him. Correct. There is there are there is many motions. Many there, motions, but, including but, but, but the prior bad acts motion. There are two, two we care about. One is this. We also care about the prior bad acts one because that's the one right. where he received. That's one of the two. So there's that's a motion. There's a motion the by you by the Commonwealth. Yes. That we would like to admit in evidence the prior bad acts, which are the threats by the defendant against the victim. Right. And there's including the threat that Derosha heard the victim repeat to her. Right. And by the way, at trial, did that come in? Did DeRosha testify to what the victim had said to her? I do not recall, Your Honor. Okay, so we don't know whether that was actually admitted in evidence. I do, I, I could. Okay. But it was certainly check. presented by the Commonwealth that, that, that we would want to get in the fact that the defendant had threatened him. So the judge, of course, is reviewing the grand jury testimony to determine whether or not he should allow those in. I believe with DeRosha, his ruling was he would wait and see it was a foundational issue, but okay, I don't but, recall. But certainly he's doing that as part of his but due diligence. But he's doing that as part, right. Very diligent fellow, still is, I'm sure, but no longer, I believe, a judge. He's retired. Uh, okay, and then there's this other issue, which goes, not, which goes not only to the content of the grand jury, but to when that person appeared before the grand jury. Well, that was not really part of the discussion. What the defendant's motion was um, to... I'm sorry. The defendant's motion uh, was to keep out the defendant's statements to the police and the grand jury. Right, but with regard right. to the other motion, the motion that says he should have got a target warning. That is this one. That is the jury that one. would be relevant only if you look to page one and said, oh, this testimony was before the testimony of, the def of Woods. Because I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing. The... <laughs> In, ter in terms of the bad acts, it's the content of the testimony that the judge is looking at. He's looking to see whether or not these bad acts would come right. in. With regard to the target issue, 
the target issue is, what he's claiming now is, hey, the ADA knew about De that DeRosha was in the grand jury a week before Woods was. And therefore, when he put Woods before the grand jury, he knew what DeRosha had testified to, which mm -hmm. is that DeRosha had testified to the fact that the, that the defendant had made threats to the victim. Therefore, when he put Woods in the grand jury, he knew of these prior threats, and when you combine all the circumstances which he knew, plus the fact that he knew of those threats, he must have considered him to be a target. That's, that, that, I that's believe, is his argument, that, right? Yes, and, and I, would, I would refute that by saying, um, when you look at DeRoche's, um, you know, you look at the progression, you look at, the, you look at DeRoche's testimony, she has hearsay, multi-level multi -level hearsay uh, about threats, and she says the victim laughed about it. And then she also gives information about other possible suspects, like uh, Mr. Montero and Mr. Boyle, and she gives detailed um, information about um, how um, the victim had been labeled a rat because um, he was involved in a federal investigation that sent uh, Montero to federal prison. Yeah, but th those um, are all of that. Th that's but all I, um, uh, interesting and important potential third-party culprit issues that suggest uh, a, a view that he wasn't um, uh, the the perpetrator, not the shooter, but a joint venture. But I want to go back to uh, a question that Justice Kafka was asking right at this point now: when is does DeRosha testify to what the victim says the defendant said in a manner that arguably could be a spontaneous utterance? I don't recall it that way, Your Honor. I'd have to go back and, and, and read it, but I don't recall it as... Um, it was an argument over the phone. She wasn't even sure who he was talking to, if that's the one you're referencing. Right. Okay, so I pulled up uh, adjutant. I just want to understand where uh, this fits into, uh, into our decision. So uh, uh, the defendant in this case objects to his statements in the grand jury coming in. In adjutant, we say this opinion adopts a new common law rule of evidence, the obviously the issue of specific acts of uh, the uh, alleged victim as it relates to first aggressor if it's a self-defense case. Because the defendant alleged the error and argued it for the rule on direct appeal, she should have the benefit of this decision. Otherwise, it shall apply prospectively. So even though Judge Quinlan was applying the law of evidence as it existed at the time, uh, the, the, this court gave the benefit of the new rule since the defendant had objected to not being able to put that evidence in. How does that fit in here um, uh, as it relates to um, uh, the defendant's argument? I just see, I mean, you set a prospective rule, not based on the common law, but based on your superintendent's powers. So it's a little bit different. Um, <coughs> but I would strenuously protest that there was any prosecutorial misconduct here that would warrant any kind of... Um, All right, but your, but, your, but your answer to my question was the first point, which is uh, th this issue of target standing is saying was superintendents and that... Um, and you're saying and that adjutant was, even though a new rule, the defendant had the benefit of it because he had objected on that precise issue. I'm just trying to make sure I know what your position is. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm not sure. What, what I, 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 yeah. I think that, it's I think as I understood it, that was your position. Can, can, I don't mean to cut you no, off. No, I'm done. Um, Thank you. Um, can... Can I ask, does any of this make a difference? Um, I'm trying to understand what new comes in in the grand jury testimony versus what he's already stated to the police, because he's voluntarily given statements to the police, right? Previous right, statements. and he was Miranda's. I'd like to point out as well that four days before his grand jury testimony, he was Miranda's at the police station in abundance of caution. So Just tell, tell me what new comes in in the grand jury, because there's a lot of evidence here, um, and I'm just trying to understand what... What he says in the grand jury um, that is prejudicial evidence here? I'd have to read it again. I mean, it, to, to, to say that, he, that it would make a difference, you'd have to do that analysis. You'd have to look at the, well, that's the grand jury. That's what, I, the that's what grand I'm jury asking. Versus, uh, right. It, you'd have to compare voluminous. it to what he said during I mean, his earlier statement. So the question is, exactly. what, what did he say in the grand jury that he didn't earlier say? 
and it's meaningful here. Yes. Um, I don't want to misspeak, and it's a lot of um, there was a there were a lot, there's a lot there. That's a, I mean because before I came here, I read the police report. I read the grand jury minutes. So Does he give a thought. thorough police? I can't remember. Yeah, it was a very it's a thick transcript. So he gives um, a thick transcript to the police report. He may have some new new reasons for why he didn't tell the police certain things, but I honestly I don't. Because in the police report, he he tells, for example, he doesn't know who these people are right at the. At the Hess station, he said he. I think he um, described th two or three women. So he describes people with, even though they're one's the mother of his child. Right. He doesn't mention that he knows who these people are, and these and are then, his friends. Right. And then the second interview, he says, "Well, I, I I wasn't completely truthful because I didn't want to be labeled a snitch." That's the second interview. Okay. So in the second interview, he explains that he does know who these people are. He names some. Okay, so we have to do a harm. If, if, if all this goes, we've got a prejudicial error analysis, right? That's the standard. We've got it's constitutional error if it was, or is it constitutional It's not error? constitutional. So we, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be harmless beyond a reasonable doubt then? It just has to be what? Just the normal harmless error analysis? Um, this is very difficult. I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, um, I think if, if it's not constitutional error. It's not constitutional, I know that. It doesn't have to be it, harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. It, I believe so. Just, this just, is to, difficult. Just, 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 just to follow up on Justice uh, Kafka's statement, do we have in the record the police report regarding his first and second interviews? Yes, those were also given to Judge um, Troy. Judge Troy, with okay, that so, prior so, bad acts, but 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 uh, we have those I, in, I in, in, in our appellate yes. record, and do we, and we have I gather the testimony at, at, in the grand jury that was given to Judge Troy, is that part of our yes. record as well? Yes. Okay, so we between have between mine and defense counsel's Sorry? appendices. If between mine and yes. so we have the ability to do the comparison. Yes. Okay. And can I ask one last question? So just to make sure. But we didn't have it last time. We did not have the grand jury testimony last time. That is correct. Defense counsel did not present it as part of his uh, okay. uh, record to the court. Did the court have any further questions? No, thank you. Thank you.